Um, so if you have any questions for Beate, please put them in the chat so that we can answer them in the panel. Um, I will be sharing my screen again for the discussion. Um, so let me see. Okay, so the first question is, why is it important uh, we continue to ask these health questions within social surveys? So uh, I think this question would be really good. Uh, maybe Beata, you can, you can fire away on this one. Uh, yeah. Um, why is it important that we continue to ask these health questions with social service? Well, actually, I think the temptation, I mean, first of all, I would like to say the temptation to just say we can save money. And I think the discussion is going on. We can save money by just looking at administrative data. And why not? Because they actually uh, provide a much more objective um, uh, view um, to what's going on. But I think there is a strong case for uh, survey data sets that we need them as well. Um, and here I would say we really need it in, um, in addition to one another. So administrative data, I think, provide only a part of the official picture. They basically provide the, um, the, the registered part, if you wish. So everything that's collected in data, but not what is necessarily going on and the full extent to, to which that is going on in society. So I would actually think there's a strong case for uh, keeping survey uh, data going and keep asking these health questions. Um, there is actually also very often the, the difference between perceived situation and what you collect with administrative data um, provides quite an interesting insight in many topics. So I think that in itself is, is uh, also quite insightful. Um, and yeah. I, I would actually make the point for we, we need to keep that going. Of course, we can see which ones are um, we, we don't need to ask uh, certain survey questions, but I think in general, there's a strong case for keeping that going. Yeah. Thanks, Beate. So you really argue for, uh, for the full view, to have the full view uh, on the topic. OK, but Patty, can I ask you to, to contribute to this question? Yeah, I, I mean, I think what um, Beate said is absolutely right. And the value of having the social data alongside the health data just gives you a, a much greater insight into the, the problems and the questions that we want to ask and find out more about. And um, for example, in the ALSA data that I use, you know, there's hundreds of variables and the um, ones that I use to create my emotional support scale haven't been used a lot in the, in the literature and the research. So there's still so much more within the data that we can use and different sort of comparisons we can make. Um, and then, you know, there were like about five questions in there around cancer as well. So it was really um, a good opportunity to use that wealth of data in the social surveys to look at how it's affecting people um, who have cancer. And there's all sorts of other questions in there as well about different health conditions and long-term health conditions or short-term or just different, um, different, different health conditions people have. So, and what you can learn about that by mixing it with the social data, I think is just really, really important. So you really argue for the, the comparison between these data. I think mm -hmm. that's a really interesting point. Thanks. Nazi, can, can I ask you to contribute to this question as well? Uh, yeah, sure, absolutely. If I try and, um, you can't start a video because the host has stopped it. Um, if I can get that going, then I can show my video, my, my face as well. Let me try uh, and, and sort that for you. In the meantime, I'll introduce okay. myself. Uh, my name is Nessia, um, as I mentioned at the beginning. Um, I'm at the Center for Long Tuna Studies uh, with colleagues Danielle and Karen, um, the University College of London. And I'm actually working with the HESLINK data. I've worked with cohort data uh, for a number of years in my PhD and then a postdoc as a health economist. Um, so when I answer this question, uh, I'm biased um, because, of course, in health economics, we want to know both sides of the coin, um, both the health of the individual. Oh, I think there I am. I think I'm here. Um, the health of the individual and what goes on in their life. And I don't think you can disentangle those things. Um, so it's extremely important to know how the health affects the social side, how the social side affects the health. Um, and one project we're working on right now is uh, mental health in young people. And we're using linked data as well for that. So uh, with the next step data, with the HES data uh, to understand how young people's mental health has changed over time. Um, so I think for me, they're, they're 
you can't you can't think of them differently. I think there it is one thing you have to have the social side and the health side as well. But I'm biased because I was, you know, and I work in the area. So that's a great Nazi. Thanks. I, I really listen. You 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 approach it from different points of view, but you all argue that there's there's really the added value of the administrative data and uh, the social scientific data, and then also the health data. Thanks, uh, Steph. Over to you for the second question. Yes, thank you, Marika. That you're very nice, and I applaud the work on the mental health in the young people. I think it's fundamentally important. So the next question is, um, how important is high quality data for cross disciplinary and cross national research? We were talking just now about the access to the global data. So I'd like to turn to first Ale and then to um, Beate, if you'd like to answer these questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Steph. So, yeah, I don't think um, I don't think we can overstate how important it is um, having that kind of cross disciplinary, cross national perspective. So like some of the studies that I gave an example of um, the one from Norway that looked at data from multiple countries. I mean, health is something that affects, you know, it affects everyone all over the world. Um, and I think we're seeing that increasingly more with things like COVID-19, obviously, and the spread of things like long COVID. It's really important to have those comparisons to be made. And again, it goes back to having that social data there as well. You know, we're making comparisons on the number of people that have cancer or have a particular disease, but then it's also really important to look at the social aspects in those particular locations. Um, and I think health is an international issue as we've seen with the pandemic. Um, so yeah, and it's really important for researchers that the data they go to and the data they find is high quality and you know useful for them for their research. And I think that's why, I mean, like I say, with the data discovery stuff, it's so important that you, you know, interrogate the sources that you're using, go to trusted archives and go and use the data that's there. Um, Beata? Yeah, thank you. I think um, I would have mentioned some of your points as well, so I try to leave them out in my answer. Um, definitely, um, I, I can mirror what you said. But also high quality data, I think, are very, very important for basically evidence-based policy making, and that is on a national and international level. So um, actually, we need um, evidence, and we have seen that in COVID times now, um, in, in the pandemic, during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, that we need data to basically decide what is the next step. And and as you also said, Ale, basically, um, we are facing global challenges. So this is not a national problem. It is, uh, it is not a UK problem or a German problem or a Spanish problem. This is a global problem. And we need global data. So basically, uh, worldwide data. And um, Patty, you mentioned before ELSA data, for example, and um, why high quality data are very, very important as well is um, there is an example in the gateway for global aging, for example, where ELSA is involved and that is um, there's a portal where you have uh, data on aging from many countries. Uh, also, SHARE is involved with um, 20 European countries, Korea, Japan, other basically, um, I don't know, 10 or more, 11 on top of that all harmonized data sets and if you want to harmonize data sets i mean it's a pain but um it's very important and very very uh, useful but you need high quality uh, quality data from everywhere in order to actually make that work so so basically it is immensely important i can't just uh, stress it enough yeah yeah, thank you both. I think those are really super uh, important points that you've raised there about it being global and about the importance of harmonising data, but having um, the uh, quality there as, as, as critical. So over to you then, back, back to you then, Marike. Thanks, Steph. The I don't know, as, as, uh, are there any comments in the chat as well that we that we should have a look at before we go to the third question? Not so far. We have a question in the panel, the Q&A panel, which we'll come to at the okay. end of this interactive discussion, yeah, thanks. Okay, great. So how important is the support from service providers or and data experts uh, for your research workflow? Um, so I think first, Grai, could you, could you provide us with some insights from the service provider's view? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's uh, really important because um, the service provider has an overview of a best practice uh, they are experts in um, in this field, uh, and also they can help you to collect or get uh, access to the data that you need for your research or that you want to collect. 
So they can both help you with best practice, but also to, to kind of help you uh, with, for instance, the GDPR and um, collecting personal data that you need. So I think service provider can be really useful in this. Thanks a lot, Gray. Uh, Paddy, did you want to co contribute to this question from the other point of view, the researcher's point of view? Yeah, um, just, just to say that I think it's it's really important. Like I found it quite helpful when I was doing um, my uh, research to talk to the people who have developed the, the data set. And then particularly when you um, then go on to link data, uh, you, you need a lot of support to do that. Um, I mean, perhaps someone else could say more about that, but because uh, I didn't actually manage to do it at the time, but it was some time ago and it's come on a long way since then. But I know there was, I was talking to quite a lot of different people and there's lots of people involved in the data collection and producing these surveys and then linking up all the other data sets. And so it's, um, they're all very approachable and very friendly. So it's worth asking the questions and finding out um, what you can do with the data because there's a lot of potential there um, to do more than you probably think or know. Uh, that's very interesting, Paddy, because uh, I mean, at the, at the National Social Sci Science Archives, there is a support that you can that you can count on. So I think that's that's really important to know. Uh, Steph, I think the next can you can I pass the next question on to you? Yes, you can. So this last question is, what is your advice for researchers trying to build on or reuse uh, the huge amount of data already available on major chronic diseases and cancer? So we'd like to ask this question to first to Ali, then Patty again, and Nadir. Thank you. Thanks, Steph. So yeah, I think my advice would be any that I would give to someone who's looking at reusing data. I think really spend the time getting to know any data you're reusing, especially if you're looking at international data or data that comes in different format to the one you're used to. Um, also reach out to support from service providers and archives. Um, I know at UK Data Service we have the help desk and a lot of other archives have support for that as well. And the same thing with secure data, don't be put off by, um, by the access requirements like I demonstrated. You know, you can go and get to know those access requirements before you even get into the data. And again, I think service providers do have a lot of um, support available for accessing that data, so, so don't be put off by by a potential additional access requirement. Uh, Patty? Yeah, I'd, I'd just say, I don't know, I, I quite like opening a data set and just sort of exploring and seeing what's there. But that, I mean, there's so many variables and so many questions that it can, you can sort of start to go down a bit of a rabbit hole. So I would make sure that you stay focused on um, you know, your theoretical perspective and what you're trying to achieve with your analysis. Though at the same time, you may have to be flexible in your research questions because it might be unlikely that the data will exactly match what you're trying to do. So it's it's about exploring but and, and have, having a focus about what you want to do, but also being flexible to use the data um, as, it's, as it's best suited for your research questions and your research topics. So... Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a bit of both, but it, it can be quite overwhelming when you open up a data set, but um, just just keep looking at it and exploring it and knowing that you've got the help from the places like the UK Data Service or the other help desks um, is definitely something to bear in mind. I think I would just follow on from what Patty said there is um, try to have a focused research question um, because it can be, and I have found myself in the situation where it's overwhelming the amount of information that is available in any data set. So I think I put in the chat a link to um, the closer search engine, which searches a number of the cohort studies and a couple of others as well. So for example, if you're interested in um, cancer or arthritis, for example, you would just put those variables in, those variable names in, and then you would see what variables are available in what data set at what time point. Um, but Yes, I would uh, probably go with a theoretical angle first and then try to see what data will match your um, your question. Um, but also be flexible, which is, sounds like an oxymoron, but also be flexible in case it's not available. Yeah, that last point you raised, Nazir, that's been also discussed in, in other um, road shows in this, in this says the series, so that's important. I do like the point that you also highlighted, Ali, about you know, the fact that we need these access requirements because it's all that they're all there in place to, to protect at the end of the day and that makes the data safer 
positive for everyone involved. So thank you. So I think that's we've come to the end then, Monique, of the panel questions. So thank you very much to all of our panelists. Um, and I think we can. There is a question in the Q and A for for the panelists. I don't know if we have time, or we could just move on to the two quick, very quick polls for the audience. And I think just, uh, I think Steph yeah. also Beata has a, has a contribution to to the last question or, or question oh. before you you have raised yeah. your hand. Okay, Beata. sorry, yeah, yeah. sorry, I, I apologize. The floor is yours. Thanks. Yeah, um, there's a question. Can you say something about training of users that want to access secure data? How long does it take? Um, so basically, it takes face-to-face um, -face one day, but at the moment, we are providing it online. And for the foreseeable future, it will be online. And that's basically three and a half hours. Okay. Thanks, Beata. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, good point, yeah. And these are all transferable skills. It's not just a one time only, you know, you do get gain a lot from doing these this, these training courses. So thank you. Okay, back to you, Marike. Steph, I don't know if there's any other questions in the chat that we need to have a look at before we, we launch. I the don't call. see anything. I think okay. one thing that, that we could highlight is the, the competition. So there's okay. a request from Christy Winters in the, in the chat. Um, but in the meantime, please everyone take a look at that and see if you, you, you might be the winner of the next yeah. book. Okay, so let's just launch our first survey. With, this is just a really quick and simple question. Um, what the first about the data catalog? So we'd like to understand you know, after today's roadshow and now that you know more about the data catalog and how it can be helpful, are you planning to use it in your research? So we'll just take it up. I'm just going to go to about 45 seconds or we're on 24 seconds. Obviously, the clock is ticking away. <laughs> and then I will end the poll and launch it. And then we'll ask the same question about the data management expert guide. OK. I think we've got a good number of responses. I think we can stop here. So and also maybe those people that aren't sure yet, maybe they can contact the National Survey yes, of exactly. Social Science Data Archives yeah. To, uh, yeah. to, to understand how it could help them better in their research. Yeah, exactly, because we've just had that big, strong message and we've seen examples here this afternoon of the fact that the service providers are there to support you. Be specific, as Nazir was saying, and that's a point that's been raised in some of the other um, road shows that we've been doing. So I'll now launch the second poll. This is about the DMEG. So it's the same question. Um, so again, based on what you've learned today in this roadshow. I'll give you another 20 seconds or so to answer. So we're 15. That's nice. The, the, there's a lot of interest. Yeah. Yeah, there is. Yes, growing interest. People obviously probably need to think a little bit more about how they could use both the data catalogue and the expert guide. But I think that's a very positive outcome this afternoon. So I'll leave the floor maybe to our panelists, Nadika, for a final takeaway. And then we can we can close and thank everyone. Thanks. Yes, Steph. Yeah, so maybe every panelist can can give one final takeaway for the researchers on the call uh, for their uh, research in uh, in the cancer, major chronic diseases. Before we close off, uh, Beata, do you want to uh, have a, like a few words, uh, one sentence uh, for the researchers on the call as a as a takeaway? Yes, um, I think uh, as opposed to to some advice against not using, uh, not conducting personal data or just anonymizing data, please use the five safes framework to make all data available and also uh, sensitive and controlled data. Thanks. Ali? Um, just to say to use the data, you know, it's out there, it's all been processed, it's all been put into the archives and it's um, it's there ready to be used. Um, there's a wealth of information, so yeah. 
Great. Patty. Um, there was just a question in the box as well about how data sets may be biased if you don't include the right variables or if the right variables aren't available. So it's just to emphasize that although you have all this data, it's really important that you um, develop, like we were saying before, your question and your theoretical model um, correctly and you think about the limitations of the data, but address that as much as you can in your analysis but acknowledge that there's always going to be limitations to answering every question. And that's why we have to just keep continuing to build the knowledge. But um, so although the data is amazing, it's, it's always having that critical perspective on it as well. So be critical. That's a, that's a nice uh, advice. Thanks. Nazir. Sure. Uh, I would probably just follow along with what Ali said. Um, there's a lot of fantastic people putting in a lot of work for the data sets. A lot of work goes on behind the scenes, um, so definitely use the data. Um, there's a lot of data available, um, so yeah, I would just say use it. The reuse, you're both uh, highlighting that. Thanks. Daniele. Karen, do you want to go next? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I just reiterate what everyone else has said, just, just use all the amazing resources that are out there. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Thanks uh, to all our, our speakers today. Thanks for your, your uh, oh, Grai, sorry, Grai, do you want to give a last, uh, a last advice? Yeah, I can. Uh, my advice will be plan ahead, check your options, and have a look at the DMAG for your opportunities. Yeah. Thanks, that's a great advice, plan ahead. Uh, very useful, thanks. Thanks, Ray. Thanks to all our, our panelists. Thanks to all, uh, the SESDA main office. Uh, thanks to all the service providers that have been involved in this, uh, in this roadshow uh, on cancer and major chronic diseases. Steph, I think we can, we can close off by saying, uh, by inviting everybody to join us in the final uh, roadshow on circular economy uh, on the 28th of October next week uh, at the same time. Yeah, yes. uh, we would just definitely. And I think, yeah, circularity, the data life cycle as well, bring in more data, use that data and reuse it as well. So thanks, everyone. Um, thanks to all of our panelists this afternoon. Thank you for the participants. Don't forget that you can join the CESDA community. And thank you to those of you who signed up for the newsletter. But remember, you can join CESDA on Twitter and LinkedIn as well. So if you're interested and want to find out more, please do so. Um, and for those couple of questions that came into the Q&A, we'll confer with our panelists and get back to you through dedicated messages. So thanks again, everyone. Thanks a lot. Have a nice day. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.